Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Okay, great. So, so uh, can we have the lights down just a little bit so that people can see the slides? So first of all, I'd like to extend my heartfelt appreciation for the invitation to come and speak at SICB. SICB I, has a very, I have a very warm place in my heart for SICB. It's one of the first meetings I ever came to as a graduate student, and um, I continue to be a comparative animal biologist despite the fact that I'm embedded in a microbiology department. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that adventure today and, and what exactly is going on with that um, by uh, talking about uh, what I think will be a revolution in biology. And this is, this is obviously a technology-enabled revolution. And uh, the title of my talk is Animals in a Bacterial World, a New Imperative for the Life Sciences. And the reason I decided to present this here is because I think people in this room are the people that have the really good questions in this area. And I think that uh, people here can contribute in unique ways uh, to, to a new frontier field. So first of all, I'd like to take you back. Um, can you see the slides, or can we have the lights down? Oh, they're working on it. OK. They're just, oh. So I'd like to take you back to uh, you know, several hundred years to the work of Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who is, by the microbiologist, considered the father of microbiology. And so uh, in the 1600s, actually on October 9th, 1676, they were actually able to date this to, it's probably 3.23 in the afternoon. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> he, he, Anton van Leeuwenhoek uh, first observed microbes through the small microscope that uh, you see down in the lower left-hand corner of this slide. And so he had, Robert Hooke had invented the microscope, but a lot of people think that van Leeuwenhoek actually discovered the microscope because he was one of the first people to really to really use it effectively to look at very small things. So Anton van Leeuwenhoek, um, uh, in, in looking at this, uh, he, he first observed the microbial world on this date. And then what he did was he was the first person to actually do anything with the human microbiome. And he took a cheek swab. And he discovered uh, bacteria in his cheek, uh, when he called them animicules. And two questions arose at that point. What were these things, and what in the world are they doing? And subsequently, what are they doing? A lot of microbiologists from that, from that point forward began to work on what are they doing. What were they had to wait for a very long time. So we fast forward to 300 years, to 1977, with the work of Carl Woese. Carl was at the University of Illinois, was actually a biophysicist, and um, he was using a tool, ribosomal, his instrument was ribosomal RNA. And Carl Woese actually wanted to use ribosomal RNA to look at diversity in bacteria. Well, lucky for him, he happened to be down the hall from a very distinguished microbiologist named Ralph Wolf. So he goes down the hall to Ralph Wolf and he says, give me those weird methanogens that you're working with. And Ralph Wolf uh, accommodated him and gave him these weird uh, microbes. And so he, Carl uh, uh, Woese started to sequence the uh, rRNA from these bacteria. And he found that, in fact, the diversity of the biological world is quite different from what we had found before. And so he was able to, um, very slowly, actually, from 1970, seven to 1990, uh, he sequenced several uh, uh, ribosomal RNAs, but it was very slow at that time. So he didn't publish until 1990 what he called the phylogenetic tree of life. But I remember as a graduate student at UCLA in 1977, being in the audience when Carl Woese came to speak at UCLA, and being very excited by the fact that, you know, that he was doing this work and, and finding this diversity of the microbial world. So, but, you know, like I said, he, it was very slow. And so then what happened? Well, PCR happened. So Kerry Mullis um, had a science article in 1985. And Kerry Mullis, um, uh, you know, was that crazy person who was the uh, supposed inventor of, of PCR with a lot of other people. And 
Um, it wasn't really used very heavily until the mid-1990s. And so in the mid-1990s, people began to apply PCR. And then uh, you can see what I have up here is, is a phylogenetic tree from 2009 from Jonathan Eisen's lab. Jonathan Eisen is a J, uh, JGI uh, UC Davis professor, uh, Joint Genome Institute UC Davis professor who works on the phylogenetic tree of bacteria. And you can see um, how complicated it has gotten uh, just by the advances in biotechnology. So um, I happen to be the current chair of the National ASM meeting. And we had a symposium a couple years ago called the $1 Genome. And we are actually headed in that direction, in that um, the technology is getting so inexpensive that you can now do genomes for a lot less than you could do a long time ago. So what I have here is I have a graph of the trajectory of, of increases in, in full genome sequences of bacteria um, over the last uh, 10, 15 years. And you can see how, how it's gone up exponentially. And when I asked, I actually asked Ann Reed at the American Academy of Microbiology for this graph. When she gave me this graph, she said, oh, it's going to be completely passe because the 2012 projection is way through the roof. And that has to do, as I said, with the increase in technology that's associated with being able to do this kind of thing. Um, in addition, uh, there, what, what has happened with this is you've got all the sequencing of full genomes and huge discovery. And the discovery rate of what these sequences mean is just phenomenal. So just to give you one small example, Cyrus, Cyrus Koth, Chothia, um, in Nature in 1992, predicted that there would be no more than 1,000 protein families. Well, PFAM is a database that was established by the Wellcome Trust in 1998. And as of November 2011, there are 14,000 gene families that have been discovered through this sequencing, this huge sequencing effort. And, you know, I started to do the math, and I realized the discovery rate is two, two to three new protein families per day. Families, families per day are being discovered. And so they're finding huge amounts of, of, very, uh, of new genes and new gene families and protein families through this sequencing. So what are the lessons from these data? Well, the vast diversity of the biosphere is in the microbial world. And this is a new view. Uh, this is a completely new view. Uh, up until, you know, the, early, the 1980s, early 1990s, we thought that there were only a few thousand species of bacteria. And now we know that there are, you know, huge, huge numbers. So it's like we stepped onto a fast-moving train here. And so how will these new insights change biology? What will this mean to all of biology? Well, um, to address this question, uh, a, group of, a group of biologists got together um, at a catalysis meeting that was sponsored by the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center at Duke University. And the, this catalysis meeting was called The Origin and Evolution of Animal-Microbe Interactions, and it was held just a couple months ago. And what we decided to do is we decided to restrict it because of the expertise of the people in the room and in the principal organizers, we decided to restrict it to animal bacterial interactions. And, and what, what are we to think about in terms of animal bacterial interactions? So instead of looking at fungi and viruses and, and plants, we were just looking at animal bacterial interactions. So we decided to tackle this and ask the question of what do we know now and what do we need to know? Where should we go uh, in this field? So this is a ob obviously a very, very busy slide. But this is uh, by way of acknowledgments. This is the group of people who went to this particular catalysis center. And if you look at the middle column, you will see the tremendous diversity of individual um, expertise that was represented at this meeting to come together and um, to come together and think about these various questions. 
Um, I had the great pleasure of organizing this and working on this with um, a great colleague and friend, Mike Hadfield, at the University of Hawaii. And for two and a half years, he and I put this together. And then uh, we met in October. What we did was, this was not a regular meeting where people got up and gave talks. What Mike and I did was we divided the group into five groups. And you can see that uh, these five groups here, ecology, origins, genomics, communication, and development. And we asked those groups for three and a half days to go into a room and at the end of three and a half days to come out with 700 words. Yeah, it's, is that okay? <laughs> okay. Um, to come out with 700 words, a, a figure, and some references. And then uh, we would put together a manuscript based on this. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to give you examples of what, in each one of these categories, what, we, what some of these people talked about and how we think that this might be impacting biology at these different levels. So I'm going to start off with just a little bit more history because I think you need to, to have just a little bit more context. Then I'm going to talk about the ecology. In other words, where are we now at the ecological level? How in the world did those things get started with origins? What is the genomic basis of these things? How do the developmental pathways reflect this? And then finally, um, communication or signaling between the partners. Now one of the things that I'd like to mention right off the bat, um, because many of you in the audience will look at me and say, oh, she's a symbiosis person. This, I, want, I just want to emphasize that this is not just about symbiosis. In fact, it's not principally about symbiosis, although symbiosis is, is, a, is a very specific reflection of this kind of thing. But this involves animal bacterial interactions that are also not symbiosis in nature. And then I'll finish up by giving a little summary with some horizons. So let's just go back for a little bit of history and context. So as I you know, have analyzed this in, in my small mind, I thought that there are two impediments to the integration of microbiology into other areas of biology. One are the technical things that I've told you about. In other words, we had no way of knowing who those microbes were or what they might be doing. We just didn't have the technical know-how to do that. There was also a conceptual problem in my mind. So what was going on between the time of Anton van Leeuwenhoek and Carl Woese? Well, microbiology was going great guns in two areas. So Robert Koch is thought to be the, the father of pathogenic microbiology. So his idea was that he was going to look at disease and a disease has been very important, you know, in the history of man. He's going to look at disease and, you know, Koch's postulates and all this other thing. So germs, microbes are bad. You know, they're, they cause disease. So that's pathogenic microbiology. And that field developed great guns, okay? The, on the other side, and well, so Robert Koch's idea was that you could not possibly understand what a microorganism was doing unless you could take it out of its, whatever it was doing, take it into laboratory culture, culture it, and then, you know, that's the sine qua non of Koch's postulates, right? And then you, then you can create the disease again. So his idea was, you know, all about lab culture. And so he could only work on those organisms that he could culture, okay? Sergei Winogradsky was one of the founders of environmental microbiology. And so, um, environmental microbiology was sort of the opposite. It was like, you can't understand microbes unless you're looking at them in the environment. And so he's the guy that did the Winogradsky columns where you grow bacteria um, and, and you watch their behavior um, in natural habitats. So um, Sergei Winogradsky and others in environmental micro started the environmental micro set. And I can tell you, as chair of the National American Society for Microbiology Meetings, that has 10 or 12,000 people at every meeting, this particular dichotomy still exists. You walk in the ASM meeting and there are the pathogenic microbiologists and there are the environmental microbiologists. The animal biology community took, 
took their lead from the pathogenic microbiologists and think of microbes principally as being pathogens. And, and immunology, I think, is a perfect example. Immunology is an outgrowth of pathogenic micro and looks at, and we all look at the immune system as a non-self-recognition system. So, are we surprised that things like pathogenic microbiology are, you know, are where, where the field went? When you look at the tremendous impact that pathogens have had on human history. So this is a map of Europe showing the sweep of the plague uh, in the 14th century through Europe. So in a few years, you just had a tremendous sweep. And so, so the view, I mean, we knew that these pathogens were out there and that they were really, really important. So the interesting thing is that now, if you go back and you look at the human pathogens, either you go to the CDC website or you go almost anywhere and you say, these human pathogens, let me give you an example, Neisseria meningitidis, which causes men, uh, bacterial meningitis. Um, and, and there's a whole list of pathogens like that. If you look at them, you will find that almost every single one of them, with one exception, all you know, 30, 40 of them, have, are congeners of the normal microbiota of humans. And so we are now beginning to believe that these pathogens are spies in pre-existing conversations that the host has with their normal microbiota. So the question then, with this history, we are impeded not only technically but conceptually as biologists. What, where do we put, what kind of thing in our mind, what, in our societies, in our departments and whatnot, where do we put the idea that um, bacteria and other microorganisms are in, uh, intimately integrated into the biology of animals and plants. There really is no really well-developed conceptual home for these ideas. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about each one of these things that, that we talked about at the Nescent meeting. And um, I'm going to try to show you how we considered the, pos the, the fact that animals seem to be affected by bacteria and bacteria in kind seem to be affected by animals. So I'm going to start with ecology. And this group um, uh, thought about various, how, how the, the microbes and animals live together uh, in, in large scales. And I, what I have here is I have traits. So the microbes have a set of traits that you would all know about. And, and they are small. They have short generation time, large population sizes. And they have a pro propensity for horizontal gene transfer. And what I mean by that is that you know, they, they just they defy the species concept. They're swapping DNA all over the place. And the pan genome is, is thought to be limitless. So, so that particular microorganism that I mentioned before, Neisseria meningitidis, they have sequenced strains of the same species of Neisseria meningitis, and every time they seek, do a full genome sequence on a strain, they have 30% novel genes. 30% novel genes. So the pan genome is thought to be nearly limitless. Now animals, on the other hand, have a completely opposite set of traits. They are large, they have long generation times, small population sizes, and they really resist horizontal gene transfer, although it's thought to be more prevalent than maybe we appreciate. But they, un, you know, not anything like microorganisms. So one can appreciate that by partnering with one another, animals and bacteria can increase their scope um, dramatically. So let me give you an example of a study that was done in ecology that I think um, was a really, really well done one. And this was done by Tad Fakami's lab at Stanford. And it's called Above and Below Ground Impacts of Introduced Predators in Seabird-Dominated Island Ecosystems. And what he did was he and he, he's an ecologist. And one of the things I want to emphasize here is if you decide you want to get into this, a really powerful way to do it is to, is to collaborate strongly with a microbiologist. And he got together with a very famous microbial ecologist named Paul Rainey at the University of, down in New Zealand. 
And what he did was he compared offshore islands in New Zealand that have rat predators and no rat predators. Okay? And what he did was he measured the, he, he looked at the influence of the introduction of rats on the ecology of these islands. So he did vegetation density, he did seabird abundance, he did litter invertebrates. I mean, they just measured top to bottom. They did a very thorough um, look at this, the ecology there. And what they found was that seabird abundance um, was down 24 fold in rat invaded islands, okay? And what that meant was that, that the rats were preying on the, the seabird population. And basically what this did was it disrupted the sea to land transport of nutrients. And so there was a tremendous decrease in guano um, in, that was being carried um, onto the islands. And um, I'm afraid that many of you won't be able to see this, but look at the patterns that are present there. What he, on the left side of each one of these graphs is the rat-free environment and then the rat-invaded environment. And you can see that in almost every single measure, there is a, a significant change uh, in that particular parameter. One of the interesting things is that um, the soil nutrients uh, on rat invaded islands were down 20 to 60 percent, and the pH unit of the units of the soil are, uh, changed dramatically from 4.8 to 6.6. .6. And those of you who have done any microbiology, that's a tremendous pH change for microbes. And so um, certainly the microbial communities are tremendously changed. But what what Tad and his co-workers found was these cascading effects up and down uh, the ecosystems and that the, that the um, change in seabird populations dramatically changed the microenvironment in the soil. The microbes in the soil uh, were affected by this and it was a cascading effect um, that, that changed the entire system. Now to give you another example, um, symbioses um, are classic nested ecosystems. And what I'm showing here are some very new data on human infants. And I, I want to, right off the bat, apologize to this group because it's at this juncture in time, there's a human microbiome project going on, which is the second human genome project, they call it. So much of the data and, and many of the stories have to do with the human genome. So what they're finding uh, when they look at succession is they're finding some really dramatic things. So if you look on the left-hand side of this slide, you see that um, a newborn is born without uh, any microbiota. But there is a drastic, a tremendous impact on being born vaginally as opposed to being born cesarean. And what they're finding is that not only is there an impact right then, but also, those children do not get a normal microbiota even at the end of the first year. So if they compare, you know, cesarean delivered children with um, vaginally delivered children, they're still not normal. Um, and it takes them a long time. But you can see that there's a succession that we go through and so that there are these communities. There's a lot of evidence now to show that they're co-evolved and there's genetic determinants associated with the microbial communities that are on, in and on humans. So, we've, we had ecology, we've got tremendous impacts up and down the ecosystems, and um, we have uh, very strong symbiotic associations. And there are lots of other stories in symbiosis, as you might imagine. So in Origins, um, Andy Knoll was the head of that group. And that group asked when and how did these complex ecosystems evolve? So many of this will be very familiar to this group because uh, it seems to be correlated and highly tied to changes in atmospheric oxygen. And so um, at somewhere you know, between three and two billion years ago, 
Uh, we get the, uh, the eukaryotes coming onto the scene, and then at that point there's a, a big bunk, bump in atmospheric oxygen, and then again uh, just before the diversification of the animals. So um, you asked, I mean, the question came up, is there any evidence for bacteria participating in the evolution of multicellularity? So uh, in fact, um, many of you probably know Nicole King at the University of California, Berkeley. And Nicole um, has shown with colleagues that it's almost certain that the coanoflagellates are the, um, are the, the, the organisms, the, the uh, unicellular eukaryotes that gave rise to the metazoans. And Nicole has also shown <laughs> that in certain coanoflagellate species, the, they will become multicellular, and they form these little rosettes that you see in the bottom right. They form these little rosettes in response to specific bacteria in the environment. And so that the formation of multicellularity in these coanoflagellates um, is, is like something that might have happened uh, historically. When she looked at the genes and the proteins that are associated with this behavior, she found cadherins and other sorts of cell adhesion molecules that are typically associated with multicellularity. And so the, the proteins were present, and the bacteria in this particular case were inducers uh, to multicellularity. And so her idea is that perhaps historically this may have been one of the ways. And there are all kinds of other theories about how multicellularity might have arisen, but this certainly um, is one that's coming to the fore. So now, is there any other evidence for bacteria driving other ma major milestones in animal evolution? Well, now we're in the complete and utter realm of speculation. We have no idea there because nobody's really looked at this sort of thing. The animal biologists are over here doing things, and the microbiologists are over there doing things. And rarely do the two come together. So, you know, there are all kinds of things you might wonder about, like um, the diversification of the gut. And certainly in things like ungulates, where you get multi-chambered guts and whatnot, the microbes participated in driving uh, evolution of those complex digestive systems. But what about things like, um, certainly the development of the salome, um, if it didn't, if it wasn't driven by the microbes, which it may not have been, but it was certainly enabled microbes to become more of a player in, in digestion because the formation of the slum, of course, separates um, the gut from the body wall and allows it to become um, long and so long and, and um, compartmentalized. And so, you know, there, what we're finding is that, that animals have microbes in their guts. And so the extent to which these things have driven evolution, we are, this is the frontier in discovering those sorts of things. So there, there are some other milestones along there. Um, adaptive immunity is another one. Um, adaptive immunity fell into the vertebrate um, line at the agnathanathostome tr transition. And a shared derived character of all the nathostome vertebrates is the carriage of a consortium in the gut. And a lot of invertebrates don't have very complex consortia. And perhaps the adaptive immune system is not a non-self-recognition system as much as it is an ecological management system. But that's something um, that's, there are a couple of immunologists now, Sarkis Masmanian at, um, at Caltech and Gerardi Barrel at the Pasteur that are following up on that idea. Okay, so what about genomics? So we've talked about where, you know, some of the ecological things that are there, where they might have come from, and what about the genomic basis of some of this? Well, is there a genomic signature that you can recognize to the presence of bacteria? So this is a friend of mine, Victoria Orphan, at Caltech. And Victoria is wearing a t-shirt saying mostly microbes. And so, Let's for a second consider the ecosystem. 
So many of you, I'm sure, have heard that um, there are 10 to the, th on average in a human, there are 10 to the 13th body cells and 10 to the 14th bacterial cells. I'm walking around in this ecosystem. Um, it's one-to-one -one by gene number because the average genome of a bacterium is about uh, 3,000 genes and the average genome of a human is 23,900 genes. So it's about one-to-one. -one. Um, and the gene diversity in the bacteria is about one to 200. In other words, much, much, much more diversity in the bacterial genes that are present in the bacteria that you have in you. The other thing to remember is that they are incredibly incredibly metabolically active, incredibly metabolically active, which I will come back to a little bit later on. So that's the bacteria out there. What about the genes in the eukaryotic human cells? What is their signature? And so um, we have here the origin of the host genes, and um, a large percentage of them trace all the way back to the bacteria. And then some of them seem to have been invented at the eukaryotes. And this is a human, and so you can see that um, a small percentage of them are actually primate genes. So your own genetic signature has a very strong bacterial under, undercurrent. So how is this derived? Well, um, we had two people in our group, uh, the head of the Max Planck Institute, for evolutionary biology in Plon, Germany, a guy named Dieter Tautz. And the other person in the group who was, had been a postdoc with Dieter was a guy named Tomislav domazet Lotso. And these guys, uh, Tomislav, while he was in Dieter's lab, developed something called phylostratigraphy. And what he did was um, he took all of the sequences available, all of them, full genome sequences, EST databases, and everything. And he built, um, in this case, um, he looked at the evolutionary trajectory of humans, and he did it in 19 steps. And this is similar to a very elegant study that Mark Martindale's lab did on deriving um, the phylogenetic relatedness of the invertebrates, or of the animal kingdom, um, by looking at all genome sequences. But in this case, what um, Domazet Lotso did was he did the trajectory of the human human genes. And so he, he, could, he could get the, the evolution of humans into 19 steps. And so um, by, by comparing, by putting all the gene uh, sequencing into, into a database. So what he found um, here, as you could see in this graph, is you can see the bumps where different things uh, were, different things uh, came on the scene, different gene families and whatnot. The thing that was really cool about what he did was then there are 1,300, or excuse me, 1,760 genes for which there is known to be a genetic lesion that causes a human disease. In other words, they can map that particular um, genetic problem like cystic fibrosis. There's 1,760. And they asked the question, when were those evolved, thinking that they were human diseases, that maybe they were primate genes that went wrong. Well, in fact, um, they're very, very ancient. Every, almost all of them, only 0.6% of them are actually primate genes. And so the disease genes um, are ancient genes, opposite of what they had predicted. But anyway, this is a very powerful thing, and, and thus far, as far as I know, it's not been applied to many animals, although he did it, um, he had a beautiful nature paper. Domazet Lotso had a beautiful nature paper in which he did it um, with a question in developmental biology. So, so we've got um, the effects of, on, on bacterial ev gene evolution. So we've had some idea that bacteria can affect animals. And, you know, we've got a lot of bacteria here, and we've got a lot of bacteria in our own genomes. But also, um, living with animals has affected bacterial gene evolution. So a couple of examples I've listed here are you have extreme genome reduction. Uh, Nancy Moran's lab and her, her academic children and grandchildren and whatnot have gone off to study this phenomenon of genome reduction. So these intracellular symbionts 
<laughs> get in there and they stay in there. And th over time, the genome gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It's really dramatic. Also, um, in certain, they're finding when they sequence certain microbes that seem to be persistently associated with mammals, in the case, in the case that's been worked on, it's in mammals, there's one called Bacteroides, Bacteroid, Bacteroides theta iotamicron. And that particular microorganism has expanded certain gene families in response to living in the gut and dramatically expanded them to the point where they have hundreds of genes that do specific things that are, um, allow them to be very efficient uh, in the mammalian gut. So it's, it's a pretty cool thing. So now let me turn to development and talk to you about what we, a couple of stories about development. So bacteria, um, what we've been finding, not just in the last few years, but this has been around for a little while in certain cases, that bacteria influence animal development at many levels. So we've known for a long time that, um, that eggs will have antimicrobial activity. They will have the ability to withstand uh, microbes in the environment. But also, there's a lot of recent data to show that bacteria are often incorporated into the egg capsules um, of, of invertebrate animals in, in the environment that allow them to, to resist uh, fouling by things like fungi and, and whatnot. But what we have here is um, on the inner circle is the entire uh, life cycle. And you can see that there, are, uh, in symbiosis, you can have vertically transmitted symbioses, which are passed in and on the egg, very common in insects. And you can imagine that they might have, their, the microbes are incorporated into the events of embryogenesis. Now in horizontally transmitted symbioses, that is when the, when the microbes are picked up anew each generation, the, the microbes don't participate in embryogenesis. But that's not to say that they're not really important during embryogenesis. In other words, embryogenesis, um, during embryogenesis, the receptors and all of the things that will recognize the appropriate microbes are developed. And so um, it's, it's happened over evolutionary time that there's been selection for those various characters. And then post-embryonically, there's a lot of evidence for the influence of bacteria on development. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, I'm going to start by talking about um, about the influence of bacteria on larval settlement. So it's thought that um, in, in many cases, you know, larval settlement has been studied for many, 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 many years. I think of Dennis Crisp and all these people who have studied this particular topic. And it's thought that many, if not most, marine and vertebrate larvae settle on hard that, that do settle on hard, hard substrates require bacterial biofilms for settlement and or metamorphosis. And what I'm showing here is I'm showing the data from a study done um, in Mike Hadfield's lab on Hydroides elegans. And Mike is, Mike's lab has shown over the years that Hydroides elegans settles best uh, on bacteria-rich biofilms. And the more bacteria present, the, the more that they will settle on those biofilms. So what's really cool is this is another example of an animal biologist partnering with a microbiologist and getting down to the mechanism of what's going on here. So these guys identified the mechanism. So a graduate student, Ying Huang, in Mike Hadfield's lab, in collaboration with a microbiologist at University of Hawaii, uh, Sean Callahan, they identified a bacterial species, Pseudoaltramonas ludoviolacea, that is a strong inducer of metamorphosis, very strong inducer of metamorphosis. And then what they did is they did something called transposon mutagenesis, and that is that you drop a transposon into every gene, and then you screen that library for mutants that are defective in the character that you're looking at, in this case, a larval induction, induction of larval settlement. So they found some mutants that couldn't settle. So what they then did 
was they obtained a full genome sequence of this microorganism so that they could identify those genes. And they identified the genes uh, essential for the induction of larval settlement. They, they got it down to four genes that are critical. And it's really exciting. There are some adhesins, um, some involved in biofilm formation, and something, you know, it's kind of arcane for this group called type 6 secretion in bacteria. But what's exciting to me here is that, that these guys are, for the first time, understanding the connection between larval settlement of a marine invertebrate larvae, larva and what microbial cues and what, what is essential in the microorganisms to make this happen. And in my mind, not only could this not have happened, you know, even, you know, five to ten years ago, this couldn't have happened because the, the, the um, technology wasn't available. But I think by coupling with, um, by collaborating with a uh, microbiology lab makes it particularly powerful um, at getting at mechanism. So another one, of course, this is my favorite animal. Um, it, I just wanted to mention uh, that sometimes the, there is tremendous conservation. There, it turns out that there's tremendous conservation in these developmental pathways. So um, in the Euprimna vibrios uh, light organ symbiosis, the cell surface characteristics of the bacterial symbionts induce host development, post-embryonically. They induce host development. And, but these molecules that induce host development are molecules that everybody's always thought of as bacterial toxins. So endotoxins, one of them, lipopolysaccharide, endotoxin that causes endotoxic shock, and the peptidoglycan monomer, which is the monomer of the bacterial cell wall. Now, they're not toxins in this case, but they induce development. But they're still perturbing the animal cells. And so what happens is, is the bacteria get in, they induce development, and that also induces the animal to put into where the bacteria are living two molecules that break down those toxins. So not only is it a developmental cue, but it's there throughout the life of the animal, and it sort of seems to modulate the symbiosis. But there, there's a very strong talking to one another. And you can see down, I, for those of you who can see down here, I've listed where these very same molecules have been found in other uh, associations. So um, they found them in Drosophila, and they found them in zebrafish to be important um, in modulating these associations. And in mice, the very same molecule, so Girardi Barrel, working in, um, at the Pasteur. I happened to go to the Pasteur to give a talk. And Girard is on the faculty there. And it was a funny situation because I was very jet lagged. And I was giving the opening talk at this Pasteur meeting. And I got up and gave my talk on the squid. And it, the rest of the meeting was all going to be on immunology. And I was going to be, because I'm not an immunologist, I was going to be really bored. And so I sat down and I got ready for that sort of mindset. And I looked up and my squid was on the screen. And I thought, I, I'm really more jet lagged than I thought. But Gerard, what, what Gerard had gotten up and he said that it had long been known that in mice that the, that the gut-associated lymphoid tissue required the induction for its, for its maturation, required induction by gram-negative bacteria. And so he said, ah, if a squid can use bacterial surface molecules maybe a, for maturation, maybe a mouse uses. Um, the same molecules, and indeed the mouse does. So the point is that there's tremendous conservation. And who's surprised? I mean, we've lived with bacteria all of our evolution. Okay, so lastly, communication. So how is it that, now I've told you that, that there's a lot of, there are a lot of shared genes, a lot of shared genes between bacteria and animals. No, they speak the same language, for heaven's sake. You know, and so who's surprised that you can, you can get some kind of dialogue going, going on between these organisms? So I'm going to tell you a, a couple of stories about communication. I'd like to start off by saying that until very recently, there really was no mechanism known for, for bacterial communication. People didn't, people thought, you know, bacteriologists are, 
tended not to think about bacteria as doing any kind of behavior except chemotaxis. And so um, it turned out that Vibrio fisheri, the luminous bacterium Vibrio fisheri, when it's at high density, it becomes luminous. When it's at low density, it's not luminous. It turns out that this is the result of <laughs> the, it constitutively puts out uh, at low levels a molecule that when at very high density accumulates and causes genes to turn on that cause luminescence to turn on. This behavior was called quorum sensing. So it's like bacterial pheromones. Subsequently, you know, luminescence is a really obvious kind of phenotype. So, but subsequent to that, they, um, they found that very, very many microorganisms that live with animals, um, and even some that don't live with animals in the rhizosphere and whatnot, have this quorum sensing behavior. So it's a common you know, uh, thing that bacteria do to talk to one another. Well, not only do they talk to one another, but um, these molecules um, are, are used as part of the communication that bacteria have with animal cells. So what I have here is I have um, some work that's been very recently done in Vanessa Sprandio's lab at UT Southwestern. And she has shown that the hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine, which control those things I have there, they, these molecules have a very similar molecular structure to bacterial quorum sensing molecules. And so what Vanessa has found is that the bacteria can sense epinephrine and norepinephrine. And um, they do so with this QSEC protein that they have in their membranes. What's interesting is they sense the epinephrine. And then this is Vanessa's slide. And what she says in her slide is that it turns up virulence gene expression. Now, what hasn't been done is what about all the other organisms that are in there that are doing um, quorum sensing behavior, all of the beneficial and benign. There's been an incredible focus on pathogenesis. So if you look at her papers, she has now shown that the QSC, QSEC gene, first found in E. coli, which of course is a beneficial symbiont, um, but, but these guys are interested in it as a pathogen. And so she's found, they've found it, they've looked in every pathogen. And they found it in most of the pathogens. The question is, are they also in other animal-associated uh, symbioses? So for the mammalian microbiota, this slide here shows all the different kinds of effects that in the last, I mean, I'm not kidding you, this is, these are data from the last two to three years, max. All of these papers are 2009, 2010, 2011. And the microbiota are, you know, don't you know, worry about all the acronyms here. It's just that they, to show that the microbiota are, is affecting the immune system, it's affecting the circulatory system. They've found that um, the microbiota are essential for angiogenesis that they affect, obviously, the digestive system. An exciting area is it turns out that the microbiota in the gut affect brain development in mice, and, and then lots of other sorts of things. So it seems as though the microbiota that are in the gut, on your skin, you know, in other places, are affecting all of your biology. And how does that happen? Actually, I mentioned that they're highly metabolically active. Well, one of the things, there was, there's a guy named Jeremy Nicholson at the university, excuse me, Imperial College London. Jeremy Nicholson is a big pharma guy who would like to create designer drugs for people. And so what he's done, what he decided to do is he decided that he would do this based on the metabolome of a person. So he goes out. He goes all around the world and he takes blood, sweat, and urine from people and uh, does their metabolome, which are the small molecules. So what he, what he found was shocking to him. And that was that the, the mammalian metabolome is principally microbial. There aren't any microbes there, but the, molecule, the small molecules that are circulating in your circulatory system are principally microbial. So, um, that is to say, a large portion of a mammal's metabolic signature is determined by the activity of the resident microbiota. 
What's interesting about that is that what it means is that every cell in your body that's surfaced by the circulatory system is now and has been over its evolutionary trajectory interacting with microbial products. And so that cell wall component that I mentioned to you, that single cell wall component is now, th is now known to set the third wave of the mammalian sleep cycle. And it comes from the activity of the microbes in your gut. And so we are incredibly interwoven um, with our microbes. The question is, what about all the other animals? All these human biologists are in there doing this stuff. And these mammalian biologists, what about the other animals? And, and it just, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to, to be able to talk to you guys because I think that you guys are the ones that have the questions about how this arose and how, you know, what the impact of microorganisms are across the animal kingdom. So I'm going to finish up with a summary and um, a few horizons. And so I hope I've convinced you that new technology has revealed that animals are deeply embedded in the microbial world and that all aspects of an animal's biology are likely to be affected. And um, I think that this is something that is completely and utterly technology enabled. We did not know this until the last 10 years, even five. This is not new. This is not new information. This is my, um, this is my academic mother, <laughs> Lynn Margulis. Visionary, controversial. Lots of people really had a very hard time with Lynn. But she was a champion of microbes and always, always, always was pushing this idea way, way ahead of its time. Everybody's going, just go away. And sadly, she died in November of a massive um, brain hemorrhage. But what a visionary. And I personally think that what she said is going to be coming true um, in the next few years. So we have a challenge, though. How in the world are we going to incorporate these kinds of new, this kind of new information into our thinking when we have We've been reductionistic biologists. You know, we just, you know, since 1953, you know, the molecular biologists have been drilling down. And those of us who are organismal biologists, you know, I watched the UCLA biology department become cell and molecular in ecology and evolution. And the structures of departments and research institutes at universities are now so siloed that it's going to be very difficult to, to step back and get this going. Um, the structure of professional societies, um, I think, is the same way. Like I said, I'm the chair of the National American Society for Microbiology meetings. I, I don't know how that happened. But in any event, I might be the only zoologist <laughs> that attends that meeting um, of 12,000 people or something. And I find it really, really sad. And thirdly, the funding agencies. The funding agencies really um, are, in, in my mind, using, losing huge opportunities. So what, what, we, what might we do? I think we need to be bold. And I think I've given a couple of examples where people have bridged uh, the fields. And I think making bridges with microbiologists, actually, they're a tough, tough crowd. They really are a tough crowd. I mean, I, you know, I can tell you being embedded as a zoologist, it's a pretty lonely situation being embedded as a zoologist in the microbiology department. Um, because they, they really are a very focused group. But find one that is willing to open their mind and work with you on some of these things. And it's very, very rewarding. And like I said, it, this is currently a biomedical focus, which is sad in my mind, because um, I'm a basic biologist. But so much of the money is the Human Microbiome Project. I mean, this just impacts all the rest of biology. And, and we just need to make that happen. So I think it's my opinion that we need to incorporate much, much more microbiology in introductory courses. So if you look at any of those introductory biology textbooks, the prokaryotes are buried somewhere toward when they're looking at the diversity of the, of the biosphere. 
there are 20 pages or something on prokaryotes. And I'm very excited because I have an opportunity. I was invited as a Moore professor at Caltech to develop a completely new introductory biology course with Diane Newman um, based on integrating microbiology uh, into the rest of biology. And Diane is a, is a microbiologist, and, and I'm an organismal uh, animal biologist. And so um, I'm very excited about the opportunity to think about how, how to make that happen. But currently, in most introductory biology courses, um, unless they're a micro major, they get very few lectures on microbiology. Thirdly, societies. I watched SICBI. I was at a meeting where Rudy Raff said, we have Devo Evo happening. Where should, that, where should we go? What meeting should we go to with Devo Evo? And I raised my hand and I said, you've got one. You've got SICBI. That's a great group of people. And I've watched Evo Devo become huge at SICBI. And it's really, really, really exciting. And I think that SICBI is a terrific place for this sort of thing to happen. And I'm hoping that, that, that it might be a, a home for looking at this kind of thing. Currently, there really is no home. There are a few Gordon conferences and you know, various meetings. But there really is no home for the full development of this, this arena. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> I think we need to challenge the funding agencies to support the developing frontiers. There's just not enough support. There's not enough, not enough support for anything, of course, as we all know. Um, <clears throat> but this vast frontier is, really needs good support. And <clears throat> I think it's, it so far hasn't been happening at a level that it needs to happen. So with that, I'd like to, <coughs> excuse me, on behalf of all of the people that participated in the catalysis meeting uh, with me uh, and Mike, I'd like to special thank you to Mike Hadfield um, and all the people of the Nescent meeting, and I'd like to thank you for listening to our story. Am I off?